The Lamb Jewish Library of Australia would like to thank you for attending tonight's author talk with Sue Smethurst in conversation with Ashley Brown. My name is Lauren Joffe and I'm the Library Director. It is wonderful to see you all here tonight. On behalf of the Library Chairperson, Dr. Rolene Lamb and everyone at the Library, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all and in particular to our author Sue and Ashley. Welcome to you both. For those who have not attended one of our events before, let me tell you a bit about our library. We are a major Jewish information resource center with titles in English, Hebrew and Yiddish. We have an extensive ebook and audiobook collection, which is very easy to use. The Write Your Story program has published over 140 memoirs and we are probably the largest publisher of Holocaust memoirs in English in the world. We run an interesting program of events, including author talks, lectures, discussions, children's programs, and a book club. Since COVID-19, we have moved our programs online. For information on upcoming events, please have a look at our website, Facebook, or Instagram. We look forward to welcoming you all back to the library as soon as we can open again. The Freedom Circus, Sue's latest book, and the main topic of tonight's conversation is hot off the press, as it was just on the shelves yesterday. And we are delighted and honored to be the first to hear all about it. I am lucky enough to have received an advanced proof of the book, and I read it in one weekend. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Sue is an award-winning author and journalist who has spent more than 20 years working in the media across television, radio and magazines. She is currently a senior writer with the Australian Women's Weekly and has written eight books. The Freedom Circus is about a remarkable true story of one family's escape during the, war, the Second World War. It is the tale of how Manya, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and her husband Michael Horowitz, the grandparents of Sue's husband, escaped from Poland with their young son and embarked on a terrifying journey through the USSR and Middle East to Africa and ultimately to safety in Australia. Michael was a circus performer for the famous Stanifsky brothers and in Australia became Sloppo the Clown on a Channel 9 program for children, the Terex show. Freedom Circus is an epic story of courage, hope, humanity, survival, and ultimately love. Our interviewer, Ashley Brown, has been a journalist, a writer, and editor for more than 30 years, and has written for various publications, including The Age and the Australian Jewish News. He hosts two podcasts and is currently the senior writer for the AFL record. After the conversation, Naomi Rassaby, one of our librarians, will pass on any questions you may have for Sue. Please add them to the chat box during the conversation. Thank you to the library staff, Joey, Hannah, Naomi and Sophie, who have all helped with tonight's event. Thanks also to Bella from Penguin Random Books. Ashley, over to you. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Good evening and welcome. Sue, thanks for joining us. Um, Sue, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ashley. Oh, Thank you so oh, much good. for having me. It's lovely to be here. Good to have you with us. Um, so we're going to have a fun conversation, interesting conversation about the wonderful book you wrote. Like Lauren, I knocked it open about two nights. So it was uh, <laughs> a fantastic piece of writing, a great story. So well done. Maybe I should have so let's written start. a few more words. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was really good. So let's, um, we won't bury the lead here, um, Sue. So you're not Jewish. So I'm really keen to know, before we start talking about the book, um, how much did you know growing up and when you went to school, how much did you know and did you learn about the Holocaust? It's a really interesting question that I've reflected on that a lot since writing the book. Um, I thought I knew a lot. Naturally, I thought I you know, had a great deal of knowledge about the Holocaust and, and Jewish culture. Of course, I realistically knew very little. Um, and the more that I delved into the research, 
for this book particularly, the more I realised how little I actually knew, frighteningly how little um, I knew and I'd been taught. When I think about it now, um, you know, I was probably taught, at, I went to a, a Catholic girls' school in country Victoria. Uh, I think probably the extent of what we were taught was, was you know, and, and English classes looking at the diary of Anne Frank, um, which I would imagine is probably the extent of what an awful lot of non-Jewish children of my year growing up probably learned about the Holocaust, sadly. Marrying into a Jewish family, um, I, I obviously learned a lot more quite quickly about culture and heritage and all of those really important things. And I thought that, you know, I thought I was across it. I thought I knew and understood the Holocaust, but really, once I really delved into the research for this book, I really realised how much I didn't know. And even today, I, I think there is just so much more that we have to learn, so much more that needs to be taught and so much more that needs to be told. Um, and, and it's something I'm very, very passionate about. We were talking earlier today about your, your daughter, Alex, at school. And she's, you know, she's, uh, she's doing Holocaust studies now. I think she said she's in year seven. And, yep. she's, and she's not satisfied with what no. she's doing. No, she and, and and I guess because because our family is immersed in it, and it's very important for us for our for our children to understand both sides of their family and the heritage and the culture, which was how this book began in the first place. Um, so we have taught our children as much as we possibly can, and she's been learning about the Holocaust at school, and she come home quite frustrated. Mum, they're not teaching this the right way, and she said, Mum, I really think the teacher is just really underplaying the significance of it. So we've had a lot of conversations about that. And I said, well, you, you know, go back to your teacher and put your hand up and ask questions and ask, why are you saying this? And I said, and, and, you know, feel you should be confident to put your hand up and correct her. And, and she has done that. And I'm pleased that she's done that. But I think it's possibly symptomatic of what I see as a, a broader problem that we are just not teaching um, the Holocaust history well enough across um, perhaps non-Jewish schools, as I think we're not teaching history in general enough across any of our schools potentially. Um, how are we going to learn about the future if we don't know our past? It's so vitally important. So you first learned of the story of, uh, of Manya and Kubush from your husband, Ralph, and just that Ralph's an old mate of mine, so I've known Ralph for a long time. They were both sort of sports journalists. How, what was the genesis for you deciding this isn't just a family story that we should share around the dinner table, but this is a story that we need to get out there. What sparked it for you? Well, look, the whole thing's really started for me. I've been saying to him for a long time because he's, a, he's actually a very good writer and I've been saying, he was very close to his grandmother and I'd been saying to him, you really need to, you know, Nana's getting older, you really need to sit down and tell, write her story, sit down with her and tell it. No, 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 no. Um, she's not interested. She doesn't want to speak. And, you know, life moved on. And as she got older and we had our own children, I felt there was a great need to, as we've said, to understand the family heritage. I had heard snippets of the story from him and from other family members. And always it just seemed to me the most incredible tale of survival and on all of these aspects that went in it. This was something um, quite foreign to me and to, to my upbringing. And I thought it was, you know, an unbelievably good story, but there was this dual sort of need happening that I needed, I wanted the family aspect of it and the heritage to be protected and understood. But the more I went on, and after sitting down with Nana to begin with, to start documenting that what was originally just a family history project, it became clear to me that this was so much, there was so much more to be told and there was so much more to this story. Um, unfortunately, Nana passed away um, as we were sort of really just get, hitting our stride, I guess, into this project. And, and it got shelved a little bit, life got in the way, there was other books and things that happened, um, but it always sat on my desk and it really did eat away at me that I, I wanted to finish this. I wanted to know what happened and I really wanted to know the detail. And that's when it began to blossom into a book, essentially. So your weekly visits to Montefiore, uh, you started out to, to go and talk to her. You'd take the, the tin of photos that you had and I think you, you paint, you'd paint her nails and you'd just um, talk to her. Did she have an inkling that you were, when you wanted to sort of her to start unloading the story to you, did, do you think you had, did she know that you were planning to write it or, or capture it for the family? What, or she, did, she, did she just think after this time, it was time to tell the story? 
No, and I have to correct. She painted her own nails. I wouldn't have dared oh. <laughs> touch Nana's nails. That was absolutely very much her domain, as I wouldn't have dared touch the, the lipstick that was immaculately done, the, the eyebrows that were always drawn on perfectly. Everything was immaculate. And, and I did essentially bribe her. I mean, I bribed her time. It was pointless, you know, taking her cakes or things because at the age of 94, 95, 96, she wanted to keep her figure, as you do, of course. You know, you, you want to do these things. Um, so I would literally take her... Um, every week we'd take these bright bottles of, you know, the most ridiculous colours of nail polish, purple and orange, whatever I could find the latest thing. And she'd sit there and paint her nails as we were talking. And, and for those moments, I could actually capture her attention. And I did tell her, she, she said to me, you know what, I, I'd literally, she'd given a tin, a rusty old tin of photographs to my mother-in-law when she went into the nursing home, kind of a, well, here, you know, you look after these. And and there were these beautiful images that had no dates, no names, no writing or anything on them. So that was really my entree to be able to start to unpick this story a little bit. So I put the photos in front of her and say, well, Nana, you know, where were you here and, and who's in this photo and what can you tell me about it? And, and always it was exactly the same conversation. Why do you want to know this? And I said, because it's important, Nana, it's important to me and I want to take the story down for our children. And she and she and it really sort of cemented to me. The first time that happened, she said, but but my story is nothing special and, and pointed around the, the dining table at Montefiore where we were this particular day. And she said, and what about her and her and her? And she was literally pointing to all of the women that were sitting around her at that table. And she said, you know, what about their stories too? And that's when it really dawned on me that Nana hadn't not told her, she hadn't told the story because it was re-traumatising, it's just that she felt that, she didn't feel that her story was anything particularly special because everyone around her and in her community um, and where she lived her life in Caulfield particularly, uh, her friends and her networks had all survived something equally as, as horrific. So she was quite happy for the story to be told and quite happy for me to document it. She just didn't think it was anything really special. And obviously you got buy-in from the family to start documenting the story and then take a step further. It sounds to me from understanding that the family's thrilled. Um, I think they are pretty happy with it. I, I mean, we've certainly uncovered some things along the way that we never imagined um, we would possibly find and couldn't have predicted. But I think it's probably slightly strange for the family too because um, they know... Nan and Pop, and, and they know them in the context of being Nan and Pop and Pop telling these extraordinary stories of, you know, bedtime fairy tales of, of how the, the fabulous funny clown um, entertained the Nazis, tricked the Nazis and all of this sort of stuff. Um, in this book, it's, it's obviously in an entirely sort of different context. And, and for them, they're probably really reading about lives and people that they didn't really know. I mean, most of this took place, I've really focused on on the war period and, and they didn't know them at this time. So in some ways they're getting to know these people too that they know as their nan and pop, um, which I'd imagine is, is quite confronting at times for, for some family members too. The reconstruction in the book of the early days, the days in Poland uh, living in Warsaw, and then also the, uh, the, the, the detail with which you describe the circus that Kubish uh, was part of, that he took them to see that he was part of, Tell us how you reconstructed all that. Was that just from her memory? Was that from research that you did? I mean, I'm fascinated by that. Mostly through the research that we did. Um, I, through the conversations with her, I was able to get a sense of what she felt about the circus and how she loved it and she loved going and watching him and all of those things. But I did not have, um, in the conversations with her, I didn't have any of that detail at all. So that was part of the research project for me was um, going back, I was able to find and uncover uh, original circus programs, um, reviews in Polish newspapers of the circus. So I had very detailed information um, from that era. And through the reviews, for example, I was able to uh, find the names of the acts and the reviewers obviously detailed how their performance was. And uh, so I was able to sort of utilise that material and put that, I guess, in the context of what she would be seeing through her own eyes when, when she was sitting in that stand. Um, and uh, it was a really wonderful experience. We went to Poland last year after, essentially after I'd done the bulk of the research, we wanted to be able to follow in their footsteps. And one of the places that we visited was the Polish National Circus in a place called Julenik, um, which is outside of Warsaw. And 
they had, we went in and, and I'd been speaking with this, the man who ran the archive, who curated the archive over the internet for a long, long time, and he'd been very helpful. And he had um, these huge, enormous um, cane baskets sitting on the floor. And he said he had all of this material that had been donated to the circus archive. And as a one man band, essentially, he hadn't had time to put it all together. And he said, just have a look in those boxes over there I think this you know this period that you're talking about there might be material in there so my husband Ralph and I sat on the floor of this place you know pulling things out and, and in that we found original photos of Ralph's pop and that you know that was really quite remarkable for us and very very moving coming across this person and it was it was like I was looking at my husband I sort of you know the first one we come across took a did big deep breath and oh my god it's pop have a look and then we found in there um more information cut out um, some things that had been cut out and pasted so someone had put all of this information together um, the circus archivist had no idea who it was all of this material had been donated so we still have no idea where this came from or who originally um, gave it to them but we came across a wealth of information and it was through all of that that I was able to I, I relied on that to be able to piece together exactly um, how the circus performed, what it looked like, um, the sense of excitement, and and hopefully, hopefully, I've captured some of the colour and the movement as well. And they certainly sound like some very interesting acts were happening about that time. How did you, in doing the research from Australia before you went to Poland? I mean, obviously, you're, you're searching. There's big language barriers. Could you talk us through how you negotiated the, you know, having to do the research of things that were in Polish or perhaps in Yiddish. I was very, very lucky early on in the piece um, to be referred to originally through the, the Holocaust Museum. I was looking for a historian because I don't speak speak or read Polish. I don't um, speak or read Yiddish or all of those things. And it became clear to me pretty early on in the research that I needed this help. I couldn't, I didn't really know where to navigate to get documents in Poland. Everything's very different. And I was referred to a fabulous woman. I'm not sure whether she's on tonight watching Christina Dusniak. And if you're there, Christina, hello. Um, Christina uh, runs um, an organisation called Lost Histories and she helps people find and trace their histories and Christina was um, a godsend for me the day and, and literally um, there were many, many miraculous moments in my research for me that Christina helped me out with not least the first one when she said to me, send me through any information that, you, that you've got so far. So I sent through the details of, of the sketchy sort of details I had of, of where Nanamania lived in Warsaw. And she immediately emailed me back and she said, can I just double check this? You, you've said Muranowska Street. And I said back, yes, 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 that's where it was. And she said, oh, my God, you will not believe this. That family came to Australia. The Landau family came to Australia. They settled here too. And I know their daughter. So there was a whole lot of connections and doors that Christina opened up for me. I would never have been able to do what I did without having her and, and to tr even just the basic translations and interpretations. Um, an email would come through that would be in, in Polish and I would really, I, I could use basic things like a Google Translate to work out what it was, but I really needed detailed interpretations of, of the, the culture and what this actually really meant and, and things like camp documentation, I needed to be able to um, understand what, what does this actually mean and, and she was just a godsend being able to help me with that. So I thoroughly recommend a historian in your life. It's incredibly helpful. How harrowing was it to write the, the, uh, the chapters about life in the camps and, 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 and to some of the... Uh, awful experiences that uh, Manya went through? Oh, terrible. Um, and, and, there, and there were lots of points where I literally found myself sobbing in front of the computer while I was writing things. Um, thankfully, um, I shared all of it with, um, particularly with my husband, and, and when things were sort of, you know, happening as I was writing them, I'd be, say, I'd, you know, be out saying to him, and, and you know about this and about this and about that. So I was able to sort of offload a little bit of, up onto him, but terribly um, confronting when you, you know this person and you understand for the first time what they've dealt with. And, and she, it, can't, it, it really um, took my breath away a little bit to think that 
this beautiful woman that I knew as Nana Mani, this happy-go-lucky, witty, hilariously funny life of the party woman, um, if you just scratched a little bit behind underneath the surface, that trauma still lived there. And the fact that she was able, as I'm, many survivors do, to be able to go on with her life and yet still have this, um, this sadness and this darkness just sitting under the surface, I found um, very, very, very confronting to deal with. As Lauren mentioned in the intro, it's, it's, it's a love story. It's also a buddy story and fable. Fable Titkowski, I think that's how yeah. plays, well a shared, plays a great, I mean, that's a part of the book I love, these two, this, this friendship between him and Kubush that, in, that lasted, endured, went through some hard times. This tells about the, he brings some, I think he brings some light to this story. So I'm interested to know how, what you thought of that part of the story. Look, his, um, his role in this was really interesting and I loved it and I loved being able to um, write about him because the family spoke about Favel and Nana did really affectionately. He was such a big part of the family's life and he was often talked about family functions and events, you know, it was sort of Nan and Pop and Favel, you know, there was the three of them and it was, it was a unit and, and he was talked about and Nana would talk about him and and the, and the cousins, you know, the boys all remembered stories of, of Pop and and Fievel in the backyard, you know, smoking cigarettes and drinking whiskey and telling tales about the circus and the Nazis and all of these sorts of things. So he was a very important character in their life. But, um, and he obviously played a very important role from the beginning. And I think that friendship that they had uh, must, you know, so enduring all the way through to have connected at such a level that they did in Warsaw before the war and to have made that friendship and then continued that friendship right through until Australia. I just, I think that's um, just miraculous. And I should say, I we knew a bit about Favel's life, but not really, not, not enough that I needed. I needed to know more about him and I wanted to know more about him. Um, and I found again in the research, I was sort of getting some roadblocks about how I, where and what I would go. We, we knew that he had some family in Australia, but I didn't really uh, know who they were. So I contacted the Jewish newspaper and asked if they wouldn't mind doing a little story for me about the book. And in particular, if anyone remembered or knew or had memories of um, Kubush, my our pop, or Fievel. And um, a stroke, you know, one of one of the lucky breaks in the book, um, Fievel's nieces, Debbie and Julie, contacted me and said, We're the family, where is? And I was able to meet with them. Like us, they also had a little box of black and white photos that Fievel had kept and uh, we sat over coffee in, in Hawthorne one day going through them and literally I've opened up this box and oh, there's Nana oh my goodness there's Pop and they had and there's Fievel and they had photos of them in Africa he had written dates and names on the back of his photos thank goodness for that so I was able to put pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together that I didn't know like which camp they lived in in Africa and what exactly what dates they were there so that was just a, a beautiful discovery and I was so thrilled to be able to connect with them and I think um, I think he was a real character and I, I would have loved to have met him and got to know him personally. So we're not going too deep into it, Fable. We want people to buy the book. So we're not giving, we're just teasing <laughs> these interesting characters uh, such as Fable. We, the point is you go and buy the book and you learn all about Fable for yourself. So you've written several books. Um, what, was the, what were the unique challenges about writing this one? Pro well, obviously the family connection makes it um, harder in the sense that um, you're, you know, you as much as you're involved when you're writing a book, you are always sort of slightly removed a little bit from it. This one, it was very, um, it was very personal for us. So one of the things I guess was a real challenge was I wanted to make sure that everything that I was writing about them was true to how people in the family remembered them as much as possible. Um, and that's always difficult to do. Um, but also discovering things about the family that we didn't know that was very, very challenging. And then having to gently sort of share that information without um, really upsetting people because there were some quite um, quite confronting and challenging things that we found out along the way, um, including, you know, family that we didn't know existed. 
and some pretty terrible things that happened along the way to family and how you how you sort of gently break that news to a family member that's always really difficult and I and I was very cautious of um, not wanting to traumatize anyone or add any distress to their own lives and also to not um, not impinge on their own memories of family members as they knew them and preserved them so that was um, and I, tricky but I, I think we've overcome it okay yeah we'll talk a bit about I mean fast tracking I was gonna ask that question a bit later but we'll get to it now very sad part at the end of the book is the discovery that Manya had siblings who survived the Shire who settled uh, one settled in the United States more uh, Mordecai settled in the United States and then eventually moved to Israel and it was um, Yaakov who went to Israel um, straight afterwards they lived, that they went their lives as did Manya and another sister as well, Yadja, yeah. went through their lives not knowing, or Yadja and, uh, was in Melbourne, but the, the brothers never knew, went through their whole lives not knowing that their sisters, uh, they had two sisters who survived. No, and never knowing that one another survived. And um, uh, Mordka, he lived in the United States for most of his life, but retired in his latter years to Israel. And we worked out that he lived um, a, about, about a 40 minute drive from his other brother. So, you know, not, not, not a long way at all. And they never knew that one another existed, let alone that two other sisters existed in Australia. And when I connected with um, Yaakov's daughter, Hannah, for the first time, I mean, she, she literally, the, the first time I spoke to her, she just cried on the phone um, and she was sobbing because he had tried to find his family. He immediately in the period after war and liberation, he had spent a lot of time in Warsaw. He pinned their names up on lamp poles around. He'd, he'd written their name, left their names at the town halls and places where people were looking for lost family. But no one ever came forward. Nothing was ever recorded. No one ever contacted him. So uh, he lived his life with a great sadness that he didn't meet um, his, didn't, wasn't reunited with his family. And that's very confronting to think that they, uh, to think of the conversations that they didn't have and to, to think that the, of, of the family moments that they missed out on after such tragedy and enduring what they did just to survive, to then live their lives totally separately um, is very, yeah, it's, it's, it's terribly sad. Um, but we're delighted to be able to connect with those families now and to have um, a shared bond um, with them. We had hoped to be able to go to Israel this year after the, after the book was finished. Our, my plan was that we would be able to go to Israel and visit and meet the families for the first time. But as we know, things changed. The pandemic came along and, and um, those plans got put on hold. But hopefully next year, fingers crossed, if um, we all stay well. Did you think about delaying the book and writing? I mean, you said it's 30,000, it's how many, 70,000 words, I think. You said. Did you think about delaying the book and adding another few chapters about them? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I got to the point of when, when it had finished and look, yeah, I mean, yes, we could have, but the publishers, and that was sort of a deliberation that we made, but I felt that this, that I really couldn't take their story much beyond that was their story to tell, not ours. And I, I, given that we, you know, had only just made these connections and we're really on this very tentatively getting to know one another. I didn't feel that that was really my place to then say, Hey, you know, I, I'm going to write about your father's too. Um, that was kind of a step too far. So, uh, so it was a conscious decision to, to finish the book where it was and we'll explore those relationships privately and I hope we can build those relationships um, from there. And that's really, their, that's really their, their story to tell, not ours. And in terms of telling the story, this is the one that a couple of the, the people have written here will be interested in the answer to this one. You were 30,000 words through the story, writing it in the first person through Manya as Manya as the narrator, and then decided, no, you're going to strip it back from the start and write it in the third person. How big a decision was that? Why did you take that decision? And how long did that uh, delay in, in the writing process? It's nuts, isn't it? <laughs> it's totally and utterly it. nuts. Um, it actually wasn't a hard decision to make. I'd been writing it... Um, sort of through Mindler's voice and through her eyes, but it just wasn't coming quite the way I wanted it to. And I felt that I was excluding too much of Kubush and, I, and to be able to really, it was his story as much as hers. So I couldn't really write it in her voice 
voice and then his voice. So there were sort of technical problems that I thought weren't really quite, it wasn't just wasn't quite gelling for me. But so I wrote the I wrote 30,000 and sent um, sent it off to my editor and said to her, look, you know, this is sort of where I'm at so far. What do you think of this? And she sent me a note back and said, no, it's great. I'm really pleased with it. So, and then I'd, and I'd actually already written a couple of chapters in third person. So I sent those to her a couple of days later and, and said, okay, you liked that, but, but what do you think of this? And she came back immediately and said, oh gosh, no, that's totally different. Third, absolutely in third person. So, uh, and it, it, it did flow much easier. It felt like a much more natural way of writing their story and being able to encompass everything and everyone in it because it's not not just Minla's story it's just it's to some extent Bible story as well and I just felt that being a, a fly on the wall and was was a much more natural way to go one of the scenes I'm asking this whole personal interest because I've said oh, I've got six weeks to finish a book I'm writing I want to know the <laughs> secrets to writing a book your your other writing you know you've got other magazines that you write for your uh, uh, a wife, a mother, running a house, all the things. What are the secrets to writing a book? They talk about the cave. You've got, you know, the proverbial cave you need to disappear into to write a book. Just tell us, talk us through the process of writing a book. When was your best time of the day to write? Were you an early, right in the morning, right in the evening? How did the, the mechanics of writing a book come together? Um, well, my, my editor would probably tell you that none of it worked for me because I was so late over every, I missed every deadline that I was supposed to write for. So she'd probably tell you that I'm not the person to be giving um, writing secrets away. Um, but that was partly because the research was actually far more complex than I, than I thought and it was far more time consuming. So I generally like to write early in the morning when it's a bit quieter before the household becomes pretty crazy. So I have a, a 12 year old and a 15 year old uh, and generally from about seven o'clock until they're at school, it's it's bedlam, forget it. You know, life is over. So I'd write early in the morning and then generally once they're at school and, the, and things were quiet again, I've got um, an office here that I set up. But I did find with this book that I wrote a lot um, at the Lamb Library. So thank you to everybody there for putting up with me. I found myself, I, I, I liked to be immersed in, in other books and, and in other stories. So I wrote a lot there. And I also wrote a lot out at the Monash University Library, um, which also has a, a fabulous collection of Jewish books too. So I, I felt um, I was away, from, I needed to be, for this book, I needed to be away from, from home essentially to really have the clarity and the headspace that I needed to be able to write it because there were so many other distractions. Um, going on at home at the same time. Um, I want to know about Poland. We've got a couple more, then we're going to open up to questions from the floor. You went to Poland. Um, it's a confronting place. Uh, and I've had chats, uh, chat on my podcast to Ralph about it, but um, it's a confronting place for Jews to visit these days. On the one hand, um, Jewish tourism has become a very big part, has become very important to the country. Um, and a lot of Jews want to go to Poland to retrace their heritage and to visit towns where their grandparents, parents, grandparents, great grandparents might have lived. But on the other hand, there's an official there's a bit of denial about their complicity yeah. in the events of, of the time going on as well. How, what was your impression, particularly yours, I'm being as a non Jew, how did you, um, how did you sell that in, in your time there last year? Uh, I, I think I was expecting to go there and feel that the minute that I stepped off the plane, I would be immersed in Jewish culture. And that wasn't the case at all. In fact, it was almost like we had, we, we, well, we literally had to go and seek it out um, at every sort of point. So that was um, quite different to how I, in my mind, how I thought Warsaw would be particularly. I thought that, that the culture and the heritage and the history would be very obvious and, and proudly on display. Um, and it really wasn't. And even things like we, you know, we obviously took, we organised for historians to help us to take tours and, and to help us find the places that I wanted to find particularly. They spoke in quiet terms. Um, one of the historians that took us on, um, on one tour spoke about how he'd really only begun to learn about the Holocaust in the last sort of 15 years, which I, I, we, we were quite sort of shocked by all of that. Uh, one of the things that probably I found most disturbing out of all it was that the element of dark tourism. Um, we visited Auschwitz for a couple of reasons. One, to, to, to pay our respects, but I also felt that I wanted to be, again, really immersed at that point of 
um, history and to be able to understand and feel the history and, and to really get a sense of, of what life would have been like in those camps. But I was m quite mortified to, to find the overt tourism aspect of it. And I wrote a piece in the Australian, the Weekend Australian magazine about this, about ice creams at Auschwitz and how you know people were literally sitting on the on the grass on a hot sunny day, licking ice creams, having picnics barely um, 50, 60 metres away from where a gas chamber had been. I, I really didn't cope with that very well. I found that terribly confronting and uncomfortable and, um, and awful. And, and as we were taking our own tours around, um, people were taking selfies and there were selfie sticks out constantly and people were taking selfies of themselves climbing. And we, we actually watched and I, I, oh my, I almost felt sick watching this one young girl and her partner boyfriend climbing onto the side of a cattle car at Birkenau taking photos of themselves and, and Ralph and I just stood there aghast the whole thing we could just couldn't believe what we were seeing and I've, I've spoken to one of the coordinators at, at Auschwitz since to, and I asked him in the interview that I did how he felt about all of that and the general sense was it was it was terrible and cringeworthy but um there was sort of an understanding of as long as people were coming and learning about the history, um, they, they would do their best. And they did an extraordinary job. The staff and the, the um, operators and the tour guides did an extraordinary job preserving the history and preserving the sanctity of the, more, of, of the memorial and the site and some of those places. But obviously um, you, can't, uh, you, you can't account for tourist behaviour in the way humans behave sometimes. And I found that really quite confronting. Um, so money to say at Montefiore, why is my story more di uh, different or more special or more unique than anyone you know, pointing around the room? There might be people here watching this uh, what, with us tonight who might say, you know what, actually, my family's got a story yeah. that we should tell that I think is worth sharing like this one is. What would you, what's your advice to those people who are thinking about, uh, is it different? Is it unique? What, what would you tell them? Every story is special. Every single story is special. I would say, do it, start tomorrow. Do not wait for another minute. Um, sit down with your loved one, with your family member, chat to them, ask them about it, share their feelings and make sure that their story is recorded and documented. I, I still think that there are so many thousands of stories beyond that that have not been told and not been shared that need to be told it's vitally important that we continue to record the history and that we don't just assume that people don't want to speak about it or that their story is not important. Every story is important, every single one. And Mania didn't take part in the Shoah Foundation project, which was uh, the Steven Spielberg USC um, uh, idea, which is one for the, all the testimonies. She, she never took part in that, did she? No, she didn't. Um, one of the things that was um, terrific though, when uh, after she passed away and, and I started doing this, I went back to Montefiore and said to ask them if there was anything in her, in her files because I'd, I'd heard um, that quite often that Montefiore took down people's stories when, when people arrived at the, at the nursing home and, and they had done that. So they had actually someone as a form of therapy or, or what I'm not sure, had actually sat down with her and, and detailed her story detailed parts of her story. So I had a very good skeleton from that as well, which was great. And that had more information that I hadn't asked her, very specific things like the address that she lived, whereas my conversations with her were much more general than that. So it was it vitally, it, I think it's vitally important that we record all of these stories. It really is. We, we cannot let um, these stories pass. Okay. So I think... That's about all I want to ask at the moment, but I know Naomi, we're going to get Naomi, I think, to come on and, and ask some questions from the users. So uh, I'll say thank you for, for the time being and uh, throw it open to some questions from the floor. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Sue and Ashley, for that fascinating discussion. Let's get to some of the questions that you've been asking, Sue. Um, Firstly, people have shared warm memories of Fievel and other family members. Um, they haven't asked questions, but they've, they've shared the memories in the chat box. Um, this is from Ruth. You've interviewed some very famous individuals. Um, there's the Crown Princess of Denmark, Kylie Minogue, Olivia Newton-John. What did you find different about interviewing them as a journalist 
and interviewing someone like your grandmother-in-law for the purpose of a book like The Freedom Circus? That's a very good question. Uh, I think the interviewing is actually the same. Essentially, you're, you're, um, when you're interviewing someone, whether whether they're incredibly well known and famous, or whether it's, it's someone who has a, a, a real life um, fame in a sense, or you're speaking to because of, of a real life story, the interview process is essentially the same. You're trying to get out of them a, a, a humanity and a connection point um, that we have with them. So no matter how well known they are, what we want to be able to do is when or what I like to want to be able to do is when, when I'm interviewing them is to find out um, what that point of connection is that makes um, the people reading the story uh, understand it and empathise with it in some sort of way. So I have always preferred interviewing um, what we would, you know, non-celebrity real life people. Um, I, that's I don't that that's just my interest in area. Um, celebrities are great, and it's always inter interesting interviewing them. But I do love real life stories. I think there's nothing nothing more um, nothing more important and interesting than chatting with someone who's who's done something exceptional with their life. Um, and this one is from Helen. You've had twenty years of writing experience as an author and journalist. What is your advice for people looking at writing their first book? Uh, that's very simple. Just do it. <laughs> don't hesitate. Um, put words on a page uh, because if you don't have any words on the page, you've got nothing to redraft. Nothing is ever, no, no draft is perfect first time round ever, ever. Sometimes it's not perfect the last time round either, but you have to have somewhere to start. So find a point of interest, find something that interests you. Um, if it's a family story or another story, write it down, document it, and then start from there. Um, you can draft and you can redraft, have a friend read it, have someone you trust read it and ask them um, if there's a point of interest that they would like to see. But unless you've actually got some words on the page, you've got nothing to work with. So just do it. Um, Ian asks, um, what is your advice to other non-Jewish people about learning about the Holocaust? I, I think all of us, um, need to begin to learn a lot more and immerse ourselves in Holocaust history. Um, there are an abundance of books, libraries like the Land Jewish Library. Um, there are an abundance of resources and some ex truly extraordinary, inspiring stories, some wonderful, wonderful books. There's a wealth of material available, but perhaps we just haven't been seeking it out. So I would say seek it out, read some of those stories. There are incredible books on the shelf now, incredible books that have been published in the past. Utilise all of those incredible resources that we have at our fingertips and dive in and immerse yourself. Um, you, won't, you won't be sorry that you've done so. Brooke asks two questions. Um, firstly, she wants to know what stage in the writing process your trip to Poland was. And also she wants to know whether you used a historian in Europe to help you with the research over that side of the world. Yes, um, the answer, the, the short answer to that is yes. So we went to Poland um, quite at, at on the later stage when I when we'd done most of essentially the sort of desktop research, because I felt that if I went there beforehand, I didn't really have the full story that I needed to, to follow. And we went there with the intention of literally following in Nan and Pop's footsteps. I wanted to see where she first lived. I wanted to see where the circus building used to be. So I needed to have all of that information first for us to be able to do that so that I could essentially put the colour and, um, and the detail into the story. So if I'd gone earlier in the process, it probably wouldn't have been as meaningful and I don't think that it would have been as valuable to me because I hadn't had that research done at that point to know really what I was looking out for. Uh, I, I did use a historian again through um, Christina and Lost Histories in, here in Caulfield. She has some fabulous connections on the other side of the world, both in Israel and in Poland that I was able to utilise. Um, I also went to and spent some time at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and worked with a, a historian there. And that was incredibly helpful to me, not just while I was there, but afterwards to be able to go back to those people and say, look, I, I have this scenario, um, Nana, and particularly in relation to things like, for example, which, which route did Nana take to get out of Warsaw to go to Bialystok, we weren't really sure. There was a couple of different paths and roads that she could have taken. 
I wasn't 100% sure which one it was. So I would refer to the historians to say which is the most likely one that she would take. And we would be able to sort of unpick it and work it out together. And then from there, find things like first or additional first-hand accounts. And I relied on a lot of first-hand accounts um, from, the, from the JHI, from the Jewish Historical Institute, the Ringelblum files and archive, um, to be able to just add in all of that detail and to really give me the picture of of what, what was this journey like for her. So those resources on all sides of the world were absolutely invaluable. And I would also say for anyone that is looking at tracing their history and doesn't really know where to begin yet, um, the International Tracing Service, the ITS, Bad Arrelson, were remarkably helpful. And, and we had files after files they sent to us. And that was how we found that Nana's well, first mother had survived because we have done our research through them with Christina to try and find detailed information and they came back to us and said, we have a match here that we believe might be a relative to the information that you've given us. And, and it turned out it was because um, Jakob's file was with them too and it had the same address as the same parents' names. He'd listed the siblings. So we were able to match that. And then many, many months later, they came back to me again and said, we think we've found another one and that proved to be um, Mordka. So I, that was an absolutely uh, invaluable to me as a resource and a, res a resource that all of us can utilise, which I think is fabulous. Um, now we have another one here that's, uh, this book seems to have opened up many more avenues for investigation. Are you thinking of a follow-up? <laughs> no, <laughs> not yet, no. <laughs> Uh, no, in all honesty, I'm not at the moment. I, I feel like we've reached, you know, um, the story where I, where, where our family wanted it to be, and I, I feel like I've sort of done our family story. Although in saying that, you know, there are elements of private research that I'm still doing. So uh, there was one particular one sister of Nana's um, that we we lost trace of, and I came across a picture of a woman in the United States who matched all of her details and. She was identical to Nana and I sent the picture around to, to, uh, to family and said, you know, look at this photo. And it was an overwhelming, oh, that's a beautiful photo of Nana. Where did you find that? It's, it's not Nana, actually. Um, but this woman is identical to her. So there are avenues, um, more avenues that I'm still searching. Um, and we'll probably do those privately. And I haven't even really delved into Pop's side of the family yet. We're really not sure what happened to all of his family either. So they might be... Um, private research at the moment, but who, who knows? Who knows where it will go? And can we expect another book soon? <laughs> um, there, I, I literally have just begun work on a new one, um, and it's an Australian historical war story. I can't, can't say too much about it just yet, but, but yes, there is another one that I'm working on. And, and again, a similar sort of theme of a story that needed to be told that hasn't been told. Um, and, and it's about a group of women at war in, in Australia and a really, really wonderful, heartwarming story. So I hope that that's, um, but I'm, I'm only in the beginning yet. So I'll be in my writing cave for a little while to come, I think. <laughs> Well, thanks, Sue. I think that's all the questions we've got time for. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Rolene Lamb. Thank you, Naomi. Hi, Sue and Ashley. I'm Rolene Lamb. As chairperson of the LJLA, and on behalf of everyone here in our audience, I'd like to thank you so much for giving your time to be with us tonight and creating for us such an informative and interesting evening. I'm sure our audience were all as mesmerized as I was by your depth of research and by this incredible tale. I have just finished reading The Freedom Circus and I could not put it down. Sue, you have provided us with fascinating insights into this fabulous new book. Reading your book and hearing you speak about it has been an amazing experience. This wonderful true story shines hope and optimism in the face of enormous tragedy and destruction. And the bright light is Melbourne. I'm going to read to you just that, that bright light moment from the book, which just is just something just so lovely. As, 
A squeal brings her back to this yard in the middle of Melbourne, a city of pretty gardens and green, and green grass, of wide streets and funny looking trams, and pretty beaches and ice creams. It is laughter she's hearing, joyful laughter. And how nice is that after all the tragedy and, and horror? And it's something we can all identify with in these references to Melbourne and also to how topically even to the horse races in Flemington. <laughs> Sue, a huge thank you for all of this. And Ashley, a big thank you and much appreciation to you too for being a fabulous facilitator for tonight's event. You have elicited so much sharing in a very sensitive, insightful manner. We really appreciate you both spending this time with us and exploring, exploring a range of fascinating ideas and in such an animated and personal way. A big, warm thank you. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Lauren Joffe, Joey Wilkinson and the LJLA staff who have all ensured the success of tonight's event. The next lecture at LAM on Wednesday, the 16th of November is a talk by Professor Stephen Prower, Jews and the Atom Bomb. It will be a fascinating exploration of Jewish history and the making of the atom bomb. Our annual library appeal is to be held on Sunday the 29th of November. We really need financial support to ensure the library's ongoing services and resources. In the name of this year's appeal chair, Ian Samuel, OAM, I ask for your generosity. And we would also welcome volunteers to assist with a phonathon on that day. Thank you very much to our audience tonight for being with us, for sharing this wonderful occasion. And thank you so much once again to our very special guests. Good night, everyone.